So first, looking at, at the top of the affirmative constructive where they talk about how anywhere they help, it's good to affirm. They must prove uniqueness to genetically modified organisms. They need to show that they're essential and no other alternative can solve for the issues that they bring up. If anything else can solve, then GMOs are non-essential. Move on to their first contention where they talk about there's, how there's going to be an increase in yields. First, as a general overview, overview, remember we tell you from our case that from Jimenez who tells you that we can already feed 9 billion people, which is going to be the peak population. So an increase of yields is not necessarily essential to food security. We already have enough food. But second, look to their own clumper study, which is problematic for two reasons. First, a majority of the studies are only for one growing season and time periods measured were before the rise of resistant weeds and pests, which now exist on 60 million farms. But second, a majority of the studies also come from BT cotton in India. And during that time period, cotton production actually increased not because of genetically modified organisms, but because of hybrid cotton in the area. In fact, the study actually found that GMOs were harmful to cotton growth in India because of insect resistance. Rather, look to Peter Rosset from the director of the Institute for Food and Policy that finds in an 8,200 meta-analysis that non-GM crop yields were 6.7% higher than GM crops. Move on to their Brooks and Barfoot evidence talking about the billions of dollars in profit. Again, two problems with this specific card. First, it's completely biased. It's funded by Monsanto and only uses pro-GM data. For example, it ignores a very famous 2007 Kansas study that found non-GM yields were 10% higher. And second, its own data concedes that net there were net income losses, but they failed to actually report that in the entire study. So at that point, we're going to see that there's no net economic benefit. And we see this from the examples that are happening in the real world. For example, they say that we're going to reduce food insecurity by 15 to 20%. But unfortunately, in India, we've seen $1 billion in losses. In South Africa, we see 2,500 farmers owing $3 million in debt. And even in Argentina, where they say we're benefiting them, we actually see 60,000 small farms went out of business. Clearly, we're not showing any benefits. Then on their second contention, talking about the environmental benefits to general responses regarding the availability of land. First, GMOs actually contain vector DNA, which is susceptible to horizontal gene transfer, which enables unrelated species to mate in the soil. This in turn reduces soil diversity and fertility, rendering land useless. In fact, Vandana Shiva actually found that 10% of the formerly fertile agricultural land in the province of Punjab in India are now dead zones due to the cultivation of GMOs. So we actually don't have more land, we have less. Then our opponents talk about how we're going to have these GMO fish, and now that's going to be really beneficial. The first is that the, Hipp uh, the Hippocrates Health Institute continues that just as Monsanto is engineering Terminator seeds, GM fish manufacturers are producing fish that cannot reproduce among themselves. The reason this is really important is because it means that you're accelerating the sp species extinction of the, spe of the fish because you're disrupting natural ecosystems. And second, a study from the University of Hawaii shows that cat share programs actually decreased wasteful fishing by 25%. So we don't have to have these GMOs fish, they don't necessarily solve for the problems. And lastly, on this China, how the green wall is helping to solve for uh, desertification. First of all, remember we show you that desertification is actually accelerated by GMOs. But second, this green wall doesn't have to be GMOs. It can be any salt tolerant, uh, it can be any salt to tolerant crop. And we actually see that five hybrid salt tolerant crops already exist right now. So we can use those instead. There's no uniqueness to GMOs. Move on to how they talk about how we're going to be benefiting all these families through women empowerment. First, you can use this argument against them because we actually find that farmers on net are harmed in the economic side of the situation. But second, they don't exactly link into what they're talking about. For example, without GMOs, we can still solve the problems because their internal link is that we're going to decrease labor. However, hybrid maize has also been shown to decrease labor by 50%. So as long as we're able to decrease labor in some way, we're still going to be benefiting the women. And lastly, they never show you that these women are actually going to be increasing their education. We would actually argue that in many of these countries, those opportunities aren't e even available to them in the first place. And we need to be looking to that infrastructure before we start implementing GMOs across the board. Lastly, they're talking about tolerance in terms of the climate. The overall problem with this is that hybrids already exist that do the exact same thing. For example, in terms of
water consumption, rice hybrids decreased water consumption by 50% compared to conventional al alternatives. And, and by, the same t uh, by the same token, in terms of the potatoes that are disease resistant, there is also a disease resistant cassava and potato that is hybrid that was not made using genetically modified technology. So clearly GM technology is not essential because we can do it using alternative methods.